Hello everyone and welcome back to week four of Project Phobocam. Now this week's going to be a fair bit shorter than previous weeks because of various distractions that I've been inundated in, uh, not least of which was a certain documentary I was featured in which came out on Monday, but I'll be speaking about that in other videos. Um, but there's been some great things as well. So on Wednesday, for example, I had my very first PhD interview. I'm applying to various universities around the United Kingdom to do a PhD in astrophysics next year. And particularly, I'm looking at researching exoplanets. So how do we find them? What are they like? How do we characterize them? And ultimately, I would hope that one day that could lead on to trying to understand whether there's life on them, which is something I'm very excited by. So I'll be having various other PhD interviews over the upcoming weeks. So what I'll probably do in future video logs like this is do a kind of just summary video like this one towards the end of the week instead of a day by day breakdown. So what's been happening? Well, as you can see here, we have some components for building the desiccator. Fantastic. So uh, I'll show you a close up in a moment about the various components we have. But I will note that the acrylic box still hasn't arrived yet and we're chasing that up, but that's not going to stop us. So I'm still going to be particularly next week focusing on doing the wiring, setting up the data logger and getting everything working so that the second we have a box, we can just literally drill holes in and get started. And if the box does not arrive, we'll literally just drive to the nearest shop we can find that has one buy one and start doing this properly and testing the desiccator next week. Okay, so other things I've been doing is we've ordered some nitrogen tanks, which we're going to need to continually pump the air above the desiccator. Uh, so we've ordered three of these and each of them is, well, just a little bit shorter than my standing height, actually. There's a huge volume in each of them. And so we've basically gone completely overkill to make sure that we're not going to run out of nitrogen overnight. So uh, what else has been going on? So I've been looking at the schedule of when we can actually do measurements, particularly in the moon box. So the moon box is a really clever system which simulates the thermal environment of a, a extraterrestrial body by heating it from above and heating it from below whilst in vacuum conditions. And then it looks at how the spectra, this little chemical signature of the different compounds you're measuring, change when you subject them to those conditions. So that's what I need to actually do my science measurements and I've scheduled in the 4th and 6th of March to measure two of my clay samples. I've decided I'm going to measure one of my nontronites, for example this green one here which you saw me preparing and I'll also measure one of the Montemurlianites in there because that's just about what I have time for. So the moon box is where we get our science out of those samples but also we need to be able to check that the samples are pure and that they are right. So the way we do that is that I will also be taking a near-infrared spectra of each of them. That's to check that, well, basically, in the near-infrared, there are certain chemical signatures that are present when water is there. So that's just basically a sanity check to check that after they've gone through the desiccator that those water features have disappeared. And the second thing that I'm going to do to check that the samples are what I think they are is something called X-ray diffraction. So basically, we take our samples, we blast them with x-rays, and the x-rays then scatter off the atoms inside of the structure of these um, clay samples. And we can use that in order to build up a picture on the atomic scale of what the structure of them look like. And this is to test that after they've gone through the desiccator and been subjected to temperatures around 200 degrees Celsius, that we haven't fundamentally destroyed their atomic structure. So just two sanity checks and then one science test. So that's what I'm going to be doing over the next few weeks. But now let's take a look at our components. So here, right at the center, you can see this is our heating pad or hot plate. So this is what is going to be warming up our samples to around 200 degrees Celsius or so in order to remove the water. As you can see, I can control it just like that and set whichever temperature I want. So around 200 or so would be what I'd be going up to. Uh, but it's not plugged in at the moment, so um, hence the heating light isn't on. So the idea is here we have two sample cups. So this one is what will load the sample which is going to go in the near infrared spectrometer. And this larger one is going to hold the samples which are going to go in the moon box and in the X-ray diffraction machine. And then when, once they've both been put on there, the acrylic box will go over the top. And the acrylic box is connected to the nitrogen tank via this lovely red nylon tube here. Um, so the, the idea is that the nitrogen will be pumped into the region about this large or so. 
And then the nitrogen will replace the air, remove all the water that's in there, so that once this heats up and the water basically just evaporates out of the samples, it will then get sucked out through the pipes and leaving the samples without their water content. So different parts of the nylon tube are going to be connected together using these nylon push fittings, like so. They could just go right onto the end, just like that. Perfect fit. And in order to make sure that we don't get too much of the nitrogen just leaking out effectively, we have this adhesive. So the idea is we're going to have some pour-on film, um, that's just in a different lab at the moment, which will coat the underside of the box, and then the adhesive will be used to fix it to the acrylic box. Now, these are two of the key things, because we need to make sure that things don't get too hot, and we need to be able to check that we are actually removing the water. So this little thing here, don't know if you can see it, is a humidity sensor which is going to, we're going to drill a hole in the acrylic box and that's going to be poking inside and then these three little prongs you can see at the bottom are then going to be wired into a little circuit which we'll be using this strip board here for, for any connections we need to make. The other sensor we have is a temperature sensor which I'll just pick up and show you. So it looks very similar to the humidity sensor. These, these sensors are all quite small things. So these two sensors are going to be wired together into this device here, which is a data logger. So you can see some of the various different ports that are on here that they're going to wire into. So what these sensors do is they output a voltage. Say um, it'll be around between say one and five volts or something like that. And then what we have conveniently given from the manufacturer so let's see if you can see it somewhere on here in the data sheet there is an equation so this one in particular tells us how the output voltage is related to the relative humidity so this is for the humidity sensor so this data logger will take the raw voltage which is coming from the sensor this data logger then connects to a computer via a USB cable and the computer then plots the voltage as a function of time. And by using the equation that the manufacturer gives us, we can convert that voltage output into, in this case, a relative humidity, and in the case of the temperature sensor, a temperature. And so what we would, ex we would expect to see on our computer screen is that over time, the relative humidity, how much water there is in the atmosphere above these two sample cups, will gradually diminish, probably falling off kind of exponentially. And the temperature, as I did in my uh, brief derivation about two weeks ago, should increase, but then gradually level off. So that's roughly what we're expecting. So combining all of these together and testing that everything is working, that's what I'll be doing next week. Hello everyone and welcome back to week 5 of Project Phobocam. Now I have to admit technically this is week 6 because I've effectively lost a week due to all of the media attention due to the third round of Mars 1 selection process, so there probably will only be 7 episodes of this series instead of the originally planned 8. But regardless, progress has been fantastic, and in fact earlier this week Finally, all of the components for the desiccator arrived, and this week, I'm pleased to say, construction of the desiccator is finished. So without further ado, let me show you the desiccator. So finally, here it is, the desiccator. Let's take a look at it. The first thing you'll notice is that we have the acrylic box, which is so that we have an airtight environment, because ultimately we want to vent out all of the Earth's atmosphere around the heating element, which will contain our clay samples in those cups, and then replace it with a dry nitrogen atmosphere, dry meaning it doesn't have any water in this case. So that's what this inlay tube is for. Now it's not connected to the nitrogen tank just yet, I'll be doing that next week when we actually begin the experiments, but the idea is that this tube will connect via push fittings like these ones into firstly an evacuation tube which will suck out the existing atmosphere inside of it and then into a tube connected to the nitrogen cylinder which will then pump the nitrogen into there. So here is the central heating element which you can see is powered on at the moment but not currently heating. You can lift up the box like this and then increase the temperature setting and we'll go up to around 200 degrees celsius when we actually do our experiments. There are two sample cups on the top. The smaller one is for the clay samples which are going to go into the near-infrared spectrometer, which is to check that there's no water signals left, which basically verifies that we have successfully succeeded 
in desiccating the samples. And the larger one will contain samples to go in the moon box, where we're going to do our simulated Phobos measurements, and also some ones to go in an X-ray diffraction machine, which will look at the underlying atomic structure of our clay samples to make sure they haven't been fundamentally altered or destroyed by the heating process. What we also have here, on the left-hand side, are two measurement devices. On the left is a humidity sensor poking into the box, and on the right is a temperature sensor. So you can see there's three cables that connect each one to a data logger which we have here, which connects via a USB cable to a computer. So the red cable is the power source, which is being drawn directly from the computer. It's around 5 volts. The white cable sets the common ground, and then the two green cables are the analog outputs from each of the sensors. So the way the sensors work is that they output a voltage with a characteristic equation given by the manufacturer that relates the voltage with the humidity sensor to the humidity, the water level inside of the desiccator. And in the case of the temperature sensor, there is an equation which relates the voltage output to the temperature inside. These raw voltages will go into the data logger, which then gets transferred to the computer. And then the computer will then use uh, effectively plotting software with the equation which I've programmed into it in order to let me know what the temperature inside the desiccator is and what the humidity inside is. And the reason we're doing this is we need to know what the humidity is to make sure that we are actually purging the atmosphere successfully and there isn't, say, leakage from the outside coming in, which would defeat the whole objective of desiccating our samples. And the temperature is, as I mentioned in previous weeks, to make sure that the box isn't going to melt, because this acrylic melts when you go to around 160 degrees Celsius or so. So the construction process was mainly getting the box in order. We have some pour-on film at the bottom, which has been made airtight, with some adhesive lining it. Also various holes were had to be drilled in the box and another hole at the back actually so we could get the power source in there. Uh, there was also some soldering done to prepare the data logger. And But the main thing that's taken quite a lot of the time is with the computer which if I just check Yes, it looks like it's it's just finishing off the installation of Windows XP Service Pack 3 now, which has been taking many, many hours, which is the problem when you take a computer that's about eight years old and try to bring it into the modern world. Not particularly an easy task, but it, look, it looks like it's working, so everything is moving according to plan. Excellent. Right, so let's do a quick test run of the desiccator to make sure that it's measuring temperature and humidity correctly. Firstly, we power up the central heating pad to around our target temperature of 200 degrees Celsius. The data logger will then start recording, as you can see by it flashing that green LED. It will transmit the data via a USB cable and then start plotting it. The red curve is showing the temperature, which is increasing as expected, and the orange curve is showing the humidity, which is roughly constant because we're not pumping nitrogen through it. Thanks for watching. With the desiccator now measuring temperature and humidity, the goal next week will be to hook it up to a nitrogen cylinder and begin desiccating the samples. Next time, I'll also be bombarding the undesiccated samples with x-rays to probe their atomic structure. Until then, I'll see you next time on Project Phobocam.